A scattered dream that's like a far off memory. A far off memory that's like a scattered dream. I want to line the pieces up. Yours and mine. What's the matter, trainer? Struggling with Pokemon Stadium 2? Well, don't worry. The lab men of the YTC Institute are here to save you with some hot- Hey, hey, not yet! We've done the research, and we're here to help you with the optimal strategies for your round one playthrough. Pokemon Stadium 2 is now available on Nintendo Online if you have the expansion pack. Can't use the transfer pack though, so you're gonna need this guide. Our guide is broken up into the following segments, all for your convenience. First up is a micro review of Pokemon Stadium 2. I'm gonna keep this brief. It's good, you should play it. It's probably the best Pokemon game ever made. And when I say ever made, I, I think I am including all future releases. That sounds kind of insane because this game came out like, 23 years ago, but I don't know, man. <laughs> I haven't been proven wrong yet! I think most people's main worries about trying a crusty dusty N64 game are the graphics, and I will admit, in some areas the graphics look pretty awful. I'm sorry, that's actually a screenshot from Scarlet and Violet. Don't worry, Pokemon Stadium 2 looks really good. Now before you leave your hate comment, alright, I'm gonna cut you off. I've got the upper hand here, I got the DLC early. You might say that it's unfair to compare a battle simulator? To an open world game. Well, how about this? Why does any part of an N64 game from 2000 look better than any part of a Switch game from 2022? What about that? Ah! And that's it for the Scarlet and Violet hate. For this video. Differences between Gen 9 and Gen 2. The biggest and most obvious is there are far fewer Pokemon, there's only Gen 1 and 2 Pokemon, and also these evolutionary lines are incomplete, and none of these Pokemon that you see on screen are accessible. Gen 2 was infamous for introducing tons of new Pokemon that do not yet evolve. Deep Breath, Yanma, Sneasel, Murkrow, Dunsparce, Stantler, Gligar, Giraffering, Apom, Togetic, Piloswine, Mischievous, Porygon 2, Ursaring. This thing doesn't evolve yet? Oh my god, this thing's- Do you ever wonder if things could have been different? If the Johto Pokemon had been good from the beginning? If we kept the high quality animations? If Pokemon really did grow up with us? Maybe. Maybe if you'd liked and subscribed. <laughs> but you didn't. You did this to me. You're the reason why this Pokemon aren't horrible! <laughs> Pile of Swine's okay. So, so is Porygon 2 and Ursaring. The rest are real bad though. Oh! Huge overarching changes. There are no abilities and there's no fairy types, which you can summarize as don't use Clefable. Although the special stat has been split into special defense and special attack, there is no physical special move split. What that means is that whether a move is physical or special depends purely on the type. You can see all of them on screen now. For example, all fire moves are special and all rock moves are physical. You can summarize this whole kerfuffle as don't use Sneasel. Oh. <laughs> Instead of the modern EV system, you have a system called Stat Experience. You can kind of think of this as being able to max out all of your EVs. Don't worry about this though, because the rentals have pretty much no stat XP. All you need to know is that you are at a massive statistical disadvantage pretty much every turn of this game. Good luck! For the other Gen 2 quirks, I'm not gonna tell you. Early is. Just go to school. There is a Trainer Academy within Pokemon Stadium 2, which is the best tutorial that they've ever made. The tutorial goes really in-depth, tells you everything that you need to know, 
I'm gonna summarize it in one line. This is not a waste of time. It's a higher ranking school than Naranja Academy. Oh, I said that uh, I was done hating on Scarlet and Violet. I lied! Are you ready to talk about the rental economy? This is not financial advice. Compared to Gen 1, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that you have a hundred new options. The bad news is that they all have horrible stats, horrible move pools, horrible held items. Just awful. The enemy's Pokemon will outclass you every step of the way. In Gen 1, they only had better stats and better moves, but now they also have better items. Ah! Uh, does the RNG in this game cheat? A little bit. It does not actually read your inputs, but they do know if they're going to crit or get an added effect. So if suddenly they crit and you're like, ah, oh, they would have lost without the crit, they only picked that move because they already knew they were going to crit you. And in round two, the AI actually does cheat. For some reason, their item activation rate is doubled. I guess it just wasn't hard enough. Apparently, they also have some illegal movesets like level five Porygon with Recover. I'm sure Porygon having Recover is how it'll beat you, right? The game is broken up into two rounds. Round one is your standard playthrough. After you beat round one, you're able to challenge round two, which is sort of a new game plus. Round one is fairly challenging, but certainly doable. Round two, it's technically possible, but I'm gonna give you some advice that I learned in school. Give up. This game has a couple different formats. We're not really gonna talk about Challenge Cup. Challenge Cup gives you random Pokemon with random moves, and ironically enough, it's one of the easiest and most fair formats because you're actually not at a gigantic stat disadvantage, which you are at in all of the other formats where you are 100% expected to import your own Pokemon, which you literally cannot do in the official release of the game. Amazing. Each cup has its own rule set, but there are a couple shared rules across all of them. It's always enter with six, and you get to pick three that actually go into the battle. There is sleep claws and freeze claws, which means that you can't have multiple Pokemon on the enemy side asleep or frozen. And there's also item claws, so you cannot have duplicate items. Don't worry about this, because the only items rentals can use are the berries. You even get the Poison Cure Berry, even though, as we'll discuss, it would have been very useful. The enemies pay to win, though, because they get great items, like Focus Band, which has a 100% chance to survive lethal damage. It's not a 100% chance? Could have fooled me! <laughs> We're not going to talk about every single rental Pokemon in the game, but if I don't mention a Pokemon, you can just assume that it's terrible and you shouldn't use it, or that it's not terrible, but it's really outclassed and you shouldn't use it. The first category of rentals we're going to discuss are the arena traps. These are Pokemon that you would assume would be good based on either their performance in Gen 2 competitive or what they've done throughout the series, but make no mistake Fido. Fido's not in this game. These Pokemon are terrible as rentals. And we're gonna discuss why, starting with... Snorlax! Snorlax is the best Pokemon in Gen 2, and there's no caveats to that. It's not the best Pokemon that's not banned to Ubers, it's just the best Pokemon in Gen 2. I'm not kidding when I say that in Gen 2, you had to be careful not to leave Snorlax as your opponent's last Pokemon. Because if Snorlax was the only Pokemon, then you couldn't use Roar or Whirlwind on it to force it out and remove its stat boost, and it would actually 1v6 you. It was that strong. Snorlax leverages everything about the Gen 2 battle system in its favor. In particular, Curse and Rest Sleep Talk. The way that Sleep Talk actually works in Gen 2 is that if you Sleep Talk and pick Rest, it will actually then reuse Rest and heal you back to full. And Snorlax, with its new special defense stat, along with its defense and attack stats bolstered by Curse, becomes an unkillable <laughs> god that very, very slowly rolls over your entire team. So just to quickly reiterate, 
The formula for Gen 2 Snorlax success. Immense beef? <laughs> Thanks to the special defense buff and stat XP. It's munching on some leftovers, and it has a ton of HP, which means that it restores a ton of health passively. And if you ever actually manage to whittle its health down, it just falls asleep and then continues to get stronger as it snoozes. It snoozes, you lose, okay? None of that applies to Rental Snorlax, except for the move curse. You will be cursing as you try to use this thing. It's not the worst thing ever, but it is a far cry from the actual best Pokemon in the game. Without stat XP and without leftovers and rest recovery, it is just too frail to actually accumulate curse boosts and pull off a sweep, especially because Enemy Pokemon do have stat XP, and they're gonna be hitting you hard. You wanna try and sweep with Snorlax in Pokemon Stadium 2? Keep dreaming. Tyranitar is a behemoth of a Pokemon. It is known for incredible stats, and for its ability to automatically start a sandstorm, the sandstorm chips down your opponent, and also bolsters Tyranitar's special defense to incredible levels, to the point where you will wonder if super effective damage is actually a swindle, which you shouldn't fall for. Tyranitar in Pokemon Stadium 2... sucks ass! Look at these moves! What in the world? What are you gonna do with this? Not only are the moves terrible, but the stats are also terrible. This applies to both the pseudo-legendaries Tyranitar and Dragonite, but also to all of the legendary Pokemon. This Tyranitar is literally as bad as possible. It has zero individual values, and it has zero stat XP. Any random Larvitar that you could catch yourself would be better than the rental they give you. It is so bad. Tyranitar, oh, more like Tyranitard. Oh. Ah! At least it's OU in the modern games, right? Rental Entei, Rentei, the Flame Emperor. Legendaries available for rent, if that is what you wish. Entei, along with all of the legendary rentals, are just complete trash. <laughs> Their stats are unacceptable. Fire Blast is actually a pretty good move. Entei has 102 special attack. Who would win? A Flareon that died in a fire, guess it didn't have flash fire yet, and was resurrected to then play the leading role in Pokemon the third movie, good movie. Or one edgy dog. Houndour has more special attack than Entei. That's how bad the legendary rentals are. Look at this! These stats and this moveset, this does not spark joy. People always debate the best evolution. Nobody debates the worst evolution. Everyone agrees that it's Flareon. Flareon. Flareon has more attack and more special attack than Entei. Ho-oh, what are you cooking? Change the recipe, your resurrection spell sucks! I can't believe I'd actually pick Boosta before Entei. <laughs> Boosted. Despite being a fire type, Ho-Oh cannot cook. Heracross! Great attack stat. Champion of in-game and also pretty good in competitive. Unfortunately in this game, despite having a big horn, it's, it's not a mega horn I guess, you can do endure reversal which is very risky and not great. It does actually have Mega Horn in Prime Cup, but overall I would say that Heracross is not the force to be reckoned with that it is in competitive. It's just a very mediocre pick that I would not recommend. Sad. It must just be a bug in the system. Caesar was kind of an experiment by Game Freak. It's an evolution of Scyther, but its stats don't actually get any better. They just rearrange the stats, and it's sort of Game Freak saying, hey, we added a new type, Steel. It's really, really good. It's so good that just gaining Steel type is considered an evolution. Scizor is a huge metagame force. It is known for bullet-punching kids since 2000 and 
2007? It might be 2008, whenever Platinum released. Unfortunately, Scizor pre-Technician and pre-Bullet Punch is pretty sad. It just has no moves. They didn't even give it Silverwind. Silverwind was its best stab option, by the way. Surprisingly, Scizor with this atrocious move pool is, is not actually unusable. The Steel type is just that strong and you do have a ton of attacks. So Stab Metal Claw actually does some damage, but don't expect to uh, bullet punch your way to the top here. I, I would say that Scizor in this game doesn't make the cut. Although the cut minigame is very fun. That uses Scyther though. One of the very strange things about the Nintendo Online version of Pokemon Stadium 2 is that they added some Pokemon that weren't originally in Gen 2. So although you first encounter Slugma and Skarmory in Gen 3, for some reason they added both of them to Pokemon Stadium 2. Really weird. Skarmory is part of a terrifying defensive core called Skarm Bliss. You'll never guess what the second half of this is. But not dying doesn't really do anything. <laughs> You have to also kill your opponent, which Skarmory doesn't really do. So I wouldn't really recommend Skarmory. And for the exact same reason, I wouldn't recommend Bliss either. Sad. Ampharos is a fan favorite Pokemon. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say anything negative about Ampharos, although I've been kind of mean to it a few times. Gen 2 Ampharos is actually really, really good because the static speed system really helps patch up its lackluster speed. And in particular, it has been entered into the Elemental Punch-Out League, which gives it some impressive coverage. Rental Ampharos, it, it's got a Haymaker Punch. It's 50% of the time, it, it, it kind of does decent physical damage. At least it's got reliable electric stab. Just kidding, 50% of the time it does electric damage. Oh no. It's zappy, but I'm not feeling happy. It is pretty funny that they give it two of the least reliable moves in the entire game, along with Swift, which never misses. If you're feeling lucky and if you really like Ampharos, you could roll the dice, but my recommendation to you, wake up, Mareeple. Don't use Ampharos. Scooby Doom, known in Japanese as Heruga. Pretty scary. Really good stats, uh, really good typing, vicious dark fire dual stab. Ember and Biter your moves. Bad dog. Ride on. Why don't you ride on these massive nerfs to its move pool? Oh no. Rhydon is the stand-in for all of the Gen 1 rentals that have fallen from grace. Rhydon is terrible in this game. Dig got a huge nerf. It went from 100 base power down to 60. Ugh. Weep for Rhydon. He's been deposed, okay? There's a new Dawn in town. We're gonna talk about him soon. Jinx also got massively nerfed, although it actually got a special attack buff. Its move pool just got murdered. Lost Psychic and now only has Confusion, and it also lost Lovely Kiss, which was a very useful utility move. Jinx is not good. Electrode also got massively nerfed. Its main utility in Gen 1 was that it was the fastest Thunder Wave in the game, which was a great counter to a ton of fast offensive threats. It was never really that great at attacking, but it could attack with Thunder, supplemented by a 27% crit rate, which it also lost in this gen. Electrode in Gen 2, it's balls. Ugh. Articuno, no longer numero uno. It's now numero, how do you say 144 in Spanish? <laughs> it has the double disgrace of both being a legendary, which means it has garbage stats. It also got massively nerfed because it's 125 special became its special defense, which you don't really care about. <laughs> its special attack was massively nerfed and its move pool was also nerfed. Blizzard? Why couldn't I have had that in Gen 1? I don't want Gen 2 blizzards. At least Razorwind has high crit, right? Uh... Articuno, numero 144. How was that? <laughs> and the last set of trap Pokemon are, unfortunately, I know your heart's gonna break, the starters. I don't think anybody assumes that Meganium is good, but here's me telling you for sure, it's terrible, okay? 
For Alligator, it doesn't fare much better. 50% of the time, it does okay damage. 50% of the time, it does nothing. And my boy, Typhlosion, known in Japanese as Baguhun, more like Badhoon. Oh. And the Kanto starters also still suck. Justice for the Gen 2 starters, man. They're by far the worst, and a lot of it has to do with all three of them being filthy pure types. Grass Fairy Meganium Wen. Water Dark for Alligator Wen. Fire Ground Typhlosion Wen. Fire Ghost would also work. Next, we are going to talk about Earl's Elite. Earl is the instructor of the Pokemon Academy, and you can trust him, okay? He knows what he's talking about. He recommends that you use these, not yet. He recommends that you use these Pokemon on your squad. Not in every battle, but in pretty much every battle. You can't really go wrong with these. Wobbuffet is probably the best. He's not gonna pop up? All right. Wobbuffet is probably the best- Oh! Wobbuffet is the best Pokemon in the game. I, I think we can say that pretty confidently. In a game where a huge part of the challenge is deciding which of your three Pokemon best match up against your opponent's potential three, having a Pokemon that can almost guaranteed kill one opponent, maybe two, Maybe even three is amazing, and getting a two-for-one is one of the best things you can do in Magic. I mean, Pokemon. Did you know that this game is over 20 years old? That means that you can just look up all of the enemies and all of their trainers. If you have the extra meta knowledge, Wobbuffet goes from just the best Pokemon in the game to the really best Pokemon in the game, because if you know your opponent's moves, you can more reliably counter them. There is a caveat to that though, because the AI has a special routine against Wobbuffet, where if they have both physical and special moves, they will 50-50 between them to try and throw you off. So you can't just counter against physical attackers or just mirror coat against special attackers because if they have random moves from their off attacking stat, they might actually use that against you. Turns into a bit of a lottery. Still, on average, you can wob at least one enemy almost guaranteed either through your counter or mirror coat or through destiny bond. You have to be careful because the AI in this game is very smart. You can't just spam Destiny Bond against them because they will actually switch out and try and stall out your Destiny Bonds. The Destiny Bond kill is only guaranteed against their final Pokemon. I guess we'll explain this now because I don't know if we're ever going to talk about Wobbuffet this in depth again. But in English, Wobbuffet is just a punching bag, but it's actually based on a Japanese comedy routine called Manzai. It's like a slapstick duo. One guy is the straight man who just beats the crap out of the other role. It's called the Tsukomi, and that's what Wobbuffet is. So it's the punching bag of a comedy routine. I guess he's had enough because he's hitting back. Ugh! The names also play on that in Japanese. So Wobbuffet's Japanese name, Sonans, is saying that's how it is. And then why not the pre-evolution asks the question, is that so? And then in English, why not still ask the question? Why not? And the answer is Wobbuffet, which doesn't really work. Why not use Wobbuffet in this game? Come on out! It's Gen 2, which means that two-handed builds are still king, okay? Don't dual-wield spoons. You want to go with Kadabra. Although Alakazam does have slightly better stats, the trade evolutions are actually very close to their final evolutions in terms of stats, surprisingly so. And the extra stat XP that lower evolutions get narrows the gap even further. Kadabra was both nerfed and buffed compared to Gen 1. Due to the special split, it lost a lot of special defense. Not that you were really tanking with it anyway, but you definitely can't tank with it now. But it was buffed in the sense that it actually now has two attacks. In addition to Psychic, it can use Thunder Punch, which comes up decently often as a nice coverage move. The move Reflect itself was buffed. In Gen 1, Reflect only affected you, which made it just worse than Barrier. 
but now Reflect does actually affect your whole team for five turns. So if the situation calls for it, you might actually set up a Reflect. And we're getting into really desperate territory, but it does have Kinesis, so there might actually be a scenario where going for an 80% chance to drop your opponent's accuracy is actually the right choice. Maybe. Overall, Kadabra is one of the best hyper-offense Pokemon in the game, and although they did add dark types to try and counter you, a huge percentage of the roster is still poison. <laughs> so psychic attacks are devastating against tons of opponents. Arm specs stay winning! Hey, did you know that Nintendo Online now features the Pokemon trading card game? I play Mew! Mew! Devolution Beam! Whoa, it's an Abra! Abra gets a special shout out for being the best Pokemon in Little Cup? Look at these moves. Look at these stats for a level 5 Pokemon. This is crazy. Abra using Psychic kills almost everything in Little Cup with very few exceptions, and Dark being a special type in this game actually helps Abra, because you can actually use a special thief to actually do pretty respectable damage to a lot of opponents. Abra in Little Cup is an auto-pick, you should definitely use it. Abra! Kadabra! And we can't finish the incantation because I don't actually recommend that you use Alakazam. Magneton! Like Kadabra, got both nerfed and buffed. It was nerfed in that the special split greatly dropped its special defense, but it got a huge buff. It is no longer a filthy pure type, it is now candy coated. It is steel type, which is a massive overall buff. The steel typing is not all upside, it's mostly upside. You now giga die to earthquake, but let's be real, you probably died to earthquake anyway, even as a pure electric type. Fighting is super effective against you, but you do have really good defense, so it's probably still not a 1-hit KO. The big issue is that fire types kill you, so you do have to watch out for enemy fire types. They can be pretty dangerous. Magneton is your one-stop shop for anti-cheese. One thing this game loves to do is a ton of cheese strategies, and Magneton beats a ton of those. <laughs> confusion? Well, Confusion causes you to hit yourself with a 40 base power typeless physical attack. We've got bad attack and good defense, so we don't take that much damage from that. Magneton is our ace representative. They try to spam you with attract. Magneton is not interested. Genderless. Toxic strategies? I'm a steel type. Immune to poison. They also like baton pass strategies where they'll boost up their stats and then pass them out. You can thunder wave them to stop their speed passes. Sometimes they'll boost their evasion. You have swift. It's kind of sad. <laughs> Doesn't do that much damage, but it is guaranteed damage. Stop cheesing and fight fair. Speaking of fighting fair, Magneton does magnetons of damage with thunder. Amazing special attack, and 70% of the time you hit them. Magnets, how do they work? I don't know, but they definitely do work. Hitmonlee. Kadabras and Magneton's nerfs were Hitmonlee's buffs. <laughs> Hitmonlee, I guess he's been meditating during the three-year generational gap? His special defense is through the roof. He's 138 special defense. So Hitmonlee actually has a very useful role, which is kicking the snot out of nerds. Special attackers get blown out by this guy's furious kicks. Lots of normal types that you can bully with high jump kick, and then you can very easily 1v1 most special attackers, because your special defense is just so good. Kick them! High jump kick is a bit risky to use, it does have a missed chance, and the recoil has been sort of fixed. It no longer deals 1 HP of recoil, but it doesn't deal half your health in recoil, so it's not that much of a risk. Hitmonlee has the dubious honor of having the only boosting move I actually use in this game. Meditate is not quite Swords Dance, it's the Butter Knife Shuffle. It's only a plus one attack boost. But against special attacking nerds that can't really hurt you, you might actually consider a meditation session before you start kicking their lights out. So Hitmonlee's good, that's gotta mean Hitmonchan's good too, right? Nope. Hitmonchan, more like Miss Monchan. Ha! Well, at least Hitmontop's good, right? Nope. Hitmontop, more like Miss Mon Bottom. <laughs> it gets even worse. 
Gamers rejoice. Your drink of choice is here. Mountain Dugong is actually good in this game. Now let me be clear. Dugong's stats suck. It's <laughs> terrible. However, it is the only Pokemon that you have access to that can use the incredibly broken Rest Talk combo. In Gen 2, if you Sleep Talk Rest, you actually restore your health again instead of it just fizzling, which means that as long as the opponent cannot 3-hit KO Dugong, Dugong is pretty much invincible and can eventually chip them down, which is incredibly useful, and it, it's not the worst thing ever, just on its stats alone. Stab Waterfall, Stab Aurora Beam, that's something. Dugong is also one of the only Pokemon that actually makes effective use of the terrible items you're given. You can only use berries, but hey, one of those berries is the Mint Berry, known in the modern games as the Chesto Berry. And hey, you can Resto Chesto for one turn. And after that, you have to rely on Sleep Talk Pulls. Dugong would be a lot better if this was the full calorie Mountain Dew with stat XP. That is a big part of actually making Sleep Talk work. But even Diet Mountain Dugong is actually good enough to work in round one. In round two, the enemies, they're not drinking the dew, okay? They will just crush you because their stats are too good for you to actually tank. I actually have a Vietnamese friend whose last name is Duong, so we call her Dugong, and she gets upset about it. Doesn't she know it's a compliment? I'm talking about how good she is in Pokemon Stadium 2! After I just called Dugong's stats terrible. <laughs> We know that Rhydon fell from grace. It's because there's a new Dawn in town. Dawn Fan! Quakes for Arceus! <laughs> Dawn Fan replaces Rhydon as the premier physical tank in this game. Exact same role as Rhydon in Gen 1, which is take physical hits and then hit back really hard and probably win most 1v1 physical matchups. There are some differences between Donphan and Rhydon, mostly having to do with what the rock type brings, both good and bad. Donphan lacks the normal and flying resistance, which is a bit unfortunate, but the flip side of that is that it doesn't instantly die to water and grass, meaning that Donphan can actually take most like mediocre strength, special super effective hits, and actually hit back real, real hard with Earthquake. It actually beats special attackers like Houndoom, because Donphan is kind of thick. You can actually take a really strong flamethrower and just hit back with a quake. Sandstorm is also surprisingly useful because Sandstorm in this game is 1 eighth damage per turn chip, which is actually a lot. Donphan obviously does much better against opponents it can actually quake back against, but resorting to Sandstorm chip, it's actually not that bad. If you're ever in doubt, use Wobbuffet, but if you're ever in doubt against a physical attacker and Wobbuffet's dead, you can use Donphan. I wouldn't call him Great Tusk, but he's definitely better than average tusks. 1v1 me, Prime Cup, physical attacks only. I wish it was no items. The enemy has items, you don't. Ugh. I play Mew! Mew! Devolution Beam! Before he was good tusk, he was no tusk. Fampy has no tusks. Very cute though. Fampy is sort of the counterpart to Abra in Little Cup. Abra's the best special attacker. Fampy is the best physical attacker. Incredibly solid physical stats. Comes with Stab Earthquake. And here's something. Fampy has the exact same thickness as Donphan. They both have 90 base HP. I don't know why. In that Entei movie, there's a Fampy that beats up an Onyx. But I guess the movies are just pretend, right? There's no way that Fampy has better stats than Onyx, right? That'd be ridiculous. Primeape is actually pretty mediocre. I don't think it's very good, but I can play Mute. Use Devolution Beam. Oh, look at that. If you return to Mankey for Little Cup, Mankey's actually excellent. It's very fast and very strong for a level five Pokemon. And it's got cross chop, so 80% of the time you destroy the opposition and 20% of the time, I guess you lose the match, but the odds are in your favor. Electrode. I think we already talked about how this thing wasn't very good. 
But my Mew is still in play! Use Devolution Beam! Wow, it's Voltorb! We're not actually in Little Cub, this is actually a recommendation for Voltorb fighting fully evolved Pokémon. <laughs> You've got the Rain Dance Thunder combo, at least your attack is then reliable. But really, it's here for the coat. Voltorb has the distinction of having a lightning fast mirror coat! That's a joke. So your amazing speed stat is definitely wasted with mirror coat, which always goes last. But hey, Voltorb is actually surprisingly useful as a mirror coder. It takes a ton of damage, which means it then returns a ton of damage, which is useful in some fights we'll talk about later. <laughs> and the option for a super fast self-destruct is actually surprisingly useful. This is a very hesitant recommendation from me. I never really used it, but people are telling me that it's good, and chat's never wrong, right? We're now leaving the Johto region and journeying to Niche no Kuni. <laughs> These are Pokemon that are not great in all situations, but they're very good in certain situations. They occupy a niche. That's why we named it Niche no Kuni. Kuni means country, by the way. Starting with Steelix. That's not the same. Onyx gets a new evolution, Steelix, in this game. And Steelix is definitely a massive upgrade overall. It's kind of like Dawn Fan, but they operate very differently. So Dawn Fan's game plan is get hit two or three times and knock out the opponent in one or two hits. Steelix's plan is get hit 15 times and eventually chip the opponent down over like 10 turns. Steelix's defense stat is absolutely incredible. How good is it? It's so good that in the stat screen of the school, one bar cannot even contain it. Look, there's two defense bars. How much defense is two bars of defense? It's a lot. And Shuckles got almost three bars of both defenses. That means Shuckles gotta be good, right? Steelix's main shortcoming is that, at heart, it is a candy-coated onyx. It's got very disappointing attack. Not quite a joke, it's just not very good. Its HP is actually quite bad, and its special defense obviously is crap. So it has a much harder time against special attackers when compared to Dawn Fan. And also its moves just suck. <laughs> Donphan can quake and Steelix can slap. Ugh. Steelix mostly relies on Sandstorm Chip and the Iron Tail Lottery. If it had Earthquake, I actually would say that it would outclass Donphan, but it doesn't have Earthquake, so niche pick. And before you ask for it to get Dig, look at the Dig animation. They were merciful in that they didn't give it Dig. Quagsire. Should you acquire the Sire? Sometimes. The Quagsire stats are horrific, they're terrible. But Water Ground is a really, really, really good typing. <laughs> Quagsire mostly excels in the Elite Four, where it, it doesn't really do any damage, but enemies also don't really damage it. It will probably kill the opponents before it itself dies. I know this doesn't really sound like a glowing endorsement, but... People really, really like Quagsire, so they'll just create their own image of Quagsire being invincible and destroying everything. It's not that bad. And I can't deny, it's really, really cute. Even if I insult it, it's unaware. Not in this gen, though. Piloswine. Unfortunately, it doesn't have mammoth stats yet, but Piloswine is actually surprisingly good. It's got okay-ish attack with Stab Earthquake, which actually does massive damage. And one thing you can actually do is, even though Icy Wind doesn't actually do any damage, it does do some damage and, far more importantly, applies a slow. If you could actually go Mammoth status, for sure this would go in the staple group. But unfortunately, we're just a, a Pylo. I have no idea what that means. Can somebody please tell me <laughs> what Pylo means in the comments? You swine! It's so cute. I, I I really like this Pokemon. Kind of ironic that Piloswine requires ancient power to evolve, yet Piloswine existed in the games before Mamoswine. Got any Pokemon historians that can tell me what's going on here? After three ground types in a row, 
We are taking to the skies. We are hopping on the next flight to Kenya. It's Firo, baby. Firo's got only two stats above 100, but hey, they're the most important stats, attack and speed. Firo is mostly carried by its moves, which are actually very good. Drill Peck, excellent. Pursuit, special, don't use it. <laughs> Hyper Beam, not great, but hey, Firo is probably gonna die in one hit, so if you know you're gonna die, you may as well use Hyper Beam. And in a 3v3 format, Hyper Beam is not as much of an auto loss as it is in 6v6. If you're really desperate, you can contribute to the Toxic Gaming Discourse. Use Toxic. Maybe wear down your opponent over time. It's just some nice extra utility. I don't know what other third move you'd give it. In my experience, the best part about Firo is that in the easier cups, this is one of the best ways to just sort of blaze through the game. Because <laughs> when the enemy is using crap like Lediba and like Skiploom, you can just drill through all of them and not really have to think about your moves. As you can see, Pidgeot is complete garbage, as it always is. Four more gens until it can mega. Keep waiting, Pidgeot. But the question to ask with Firo is, why would you ever use Firo over Dodrio, which has almost strictly better stats? I think Firo has better special defense. Oh, oh I guess that's why. Ugh. Breaking news! As if Stadium Dodrio wasn't humiliated enough? Hero's Pursuit does more damage. Not salsa, not flamenco, my brother. Do you know? Natu? What is Natu? I do know what Natu is. It's mostly bad Kadabra, but it does have some niche advantages. It does have the secondary flying type. Nightshade is good for some nice, reliable damage. Don't use it against normal types. Confuse Ray can be good for some desperate cheese. And Future Sight in this game is actually typeless, so it can actually hit dark. But the most important part about Natu is that it's really, really cute. It's also pretty good in Little Cup as just a backup Abra. For the most part, it is worse than the Kadabra line, which is why this is only a niche pick. What if there was a social media site based on Natu? Like birds in general? Maybe like the sound they make? That nah, sounds kinda lame though. I think I'd call it X. Atu. I think it's pronounced Zatu. Zatu sucks, by the way. Before we land, our final flyer, Aerodactyl, slightly redeemed from Gen 1. Aerodactyl is extremely fast, 130 base speed. And it, it really only has one attack, Ancient Power, which, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's not amazing. But being able to go first, almost every time, guaranteed, is very useful. You can trade some of your speed for better offense and defense in the form of Curse. And hey, every time you use Ancient Power, there's about a 10% chance that you just win the rest of the match thanks to the Omni Boost. Should you rely on that? No. But it is fun. <laughs> and 10% of the time, it does work. And the other 90% of the time, you just get a reasonably strong, super fast rock attack. Can be good. Supersonic and Bite, unfortunately, not very useful. Supersonic is just bad Confuse Ray, and Confuse Ray is not very good. And Bite, don't get tricked. It would be useful if it was physical, but in Gen 2, all dark attacks are special. Must be why this thing went extinct. Trying to use Gengar? It's a nightmare. So instead you want to haunt him. Haunter has a very different role than it did in Gen 1. In Gen 1 you actually attacked things, and at a glance you can see, whoa, stab Shadow Ball, 145 special attack, that's amazing. Ghost is a physical type. I, I guess you could Giga Drain, 60 base power non-stab grass move. Not a strategy I would endorse. Although you could say that I'm just being spiteful. <laughs> That's another move you could use. I don't know why you would ever use spite. So despite the fact that Haunter is a ghost, its main role is actually dying. <laughs> Haunter has the fastest destiny bond in the game. So what you can do is if there's a threatening Pokemon that you at least outspeed, which you have a decent chance of doing, Haunter's speed stat is alright, uh, you can just bond them. Invest in destiny bond. 
And fittingly enough, it's even got big Andros <laughs> energy, right? If I go down, I'm taking you with me! If I go down, I'm taking you with me! And then you don't actually explode, you just use Destiny Bond. Houndour. Amazing type, amazing moves, acceptable stats. I know I seem really hesitant about this. Houndour is incredibly frail, it really cannot take a hit, but it does hit decently hard. And if there's other Pokemon on your team that want Sunny Day, we well, should probably set up with a different Pokemon because Houndour shouldn't be doing that. This is probably both the best fire type and dark type that you get in this game, which is kind of sad. I I'm not quite crying, but I definitely just wish that Hound Doom had better moves. We can at least say that although this guy is a dark type, it's definitely a good dog. Eevee fans rejoice. You get your day in the sun, although it's actually nighttime. <laughs> the only evolution that actually even makes it into niche is Umbreon. Umbreon is not invincible, but it, it doesn't take very much damage. It's got very good defenses. And the reason why it does get the mild recommendation is that it, it does very well in the Elite Four. He trounces Will, who is the psychic specialist, cannot touch Umbreon for the most part. And uh, we got a quote from Koga here. Kage Gunshin wa ore no nindo datte ba yo. He just spams double team. He spends like four or five turns double teaming and Umbreon does not care about that at all because faint attack, although it is misspelled, <laughs> it never misses. And Umbreon's not the greatest attacker ever, but if you have five or six turns, which Koga does give you, you just faint attack him down. Probably the best thing that Umbreon can actually do in this game, which actually is useful. It's not a disaster. It does have the bulk to probably win a stall war against most other attackers, unless they're like a fighting type. Umbreon's other attacks do have some utility. You can trap them in and then pocket sand them and then leave them for another of your Pokemon to deal with. But do keep in mind that the mean look trapping is tied to you. So if you give him the mean look and then you pocket sand him and then you switch, the enemy can then also switch. You gotta watch out for that. Umbreon, you can consider yourself Buraki. Umbreon's Japanese name is Buraki, which is a combination of black and lucky. So I'm calling him lucky here, okay? Please have mercy. Don't give me the mean look, okay? You can't cancel me, I have dark type friends. It's now enemy phase. You won't find Pokemon this dangerous on your squad. These are perilous enemies you need to watch out for on the opponent's side of the field. You need to prepare for and counterpick these Pokemon at the team building stage, otherwise, you should just give up. Scooby Dooby Doom, where are you? Hopefully not on the enemy side. Extremely dangerous. Hound Doom on the enemy side actually does have really good stats and really good moves. Your steel types will just get melted. Your water types actually struggle as well because Hound Doom often appears on sunny day teams, which means that your water attacks don't really work, and Hound Doom will solar beam you. <laughs> Something that makes Houndoom extra dangerous is that it is a dark type and you can't wob him because mirror code is a psychic move, which means that dark types are actually immune to mirror code. Now, I don't condone puppy pummeling IRL, right? That would be terrible. But your best bet against Houndoom is probably Hitmonlee. Hitmonlee does have really good special defense, resists the dark part of Houndoom's dual stab, and can counter with its high jump kick. So I guess we can add Hitmonlee to the Puppy Pummeler rankings. This is not an endorsement of such activities though. Did you guys know Tyranitar is a good Pokemon? It is, as long as it's not the rental one. <laughs> Enemy Tyranitar is very dangerous, it actually does have amazing stats. You never know what move it's gonna whip out to destroy you with because Tyranitar does actually get tons of incredibly powerful moves. 
And Tyranitar is a dark type, which means that just like Houndoom, you cannot wob Tyranitar. Mirror Coat does not work. And Crunch is a special move, and that's what it's gonna do against you. How do you actually beat Tyranitar? Well, he doesn't actually have the special defense boost from Sandstorm yet, so super effective special water and grass moves do actually work. I question which Pokemon you have that can actually use these, though. I think your best bet is, once again, the Lee. Tyranitar wants to claim the throne, you gotta kick him off. Speaking of enemies that can't be wobbed, sometimes there are enemy wobs, and you gotta make sure that you don't get wobbed yourself. Wobbuffet is really easy to deal with as long as you actually have options on your team that deal with Wobbuffet. Don't actually attack Wobbuffet because it will literally counter you <laughs> or make you look in the mirror. What you should do instead is opt for passive damage. This can be either Toxic from Firo? <laughs> You'll never hear that again. Or Sandstorm. Sandstorm works really well against Wobbuffet because Sandstorm is 1 8 HP damage a turn, and there is no shadow tag in this game, so you can go ahead and switch out to your appropriate answer. Wobbuffet can't actually touch you as long as you don't touch it. Make sure that you don't get rubbed out. Kingdra is kind of a sneaky pick for dangerous enemies, because it's, it's not like, that dangerous. There's just no easy way to deal with it. Water Dragon is only weak to Dragon, and there are no good Dragons or Dragon moves that you have access to, so you will never actually be able to get a super effective hit against this thing. You pretty much have to hit trade Kingdra down, which is not something you want to be doing, because you can very easily lose that since your stats in this game suck. Kingdra is not immune to being wobbed, but as you can see it has equal attacking and special attacking defense, which makes it tricky to wob. You very much will be rolling the dice with a 50-50. There's really no Pokemon that is a hard counter to Kingdra. You just have to not be weak to water and hit reasonably hard, so... Hitmonlee, you're up! It's round three! <laughs> I thought this game only went up to round two! Hitmonlee against both tyrants and non-tyrannical kings. He does a lot of work. Good news, Eevee fans, it's another evolution. Bad news is that it is on the enemy side. This is actually a very specific Vaporeon. It is Erica's Vaporeon. Why does she have a Vaporeon? I don't know. Erica's Vaporeon actually has access to Rest Sleep Talk, which does make it dangerous. So don't try and whittle Vaporeon down. You gotta kill it quick. Magneton can do it. Erika's gonna try to hit you with showers. That's Vaporeon's Japanese name. Don't take a shower. Zap them. We're gamers, okay? We drink Mountain Dugong. We don't take showers. In the recent Pokemon VGC tournament, tons of people got disqualified for genning Pokemon. They didn't catch the cheater from Stadium 1 though, cause he's back with his magical Mew. And he actually went really hard on the cheating, because his Mew's moveset is really good. It's got Psychic, it's got Earthquake, it's got Blizzard, and it's got one other move. I don't know what it is, but the three moves that I know are scary enough. His final move is apparently Thunder Punch, which is not that scary. It's holding a Miracle Berry, which is the modern-day Lumberry, so you can't even status it. Well, you can, but you'd have to do it twice, which is definitely not worth it. My suggestion for a counter is to do the do. Mountain Dugong with Rest Talk can beat it. You just have to not get crit and not get any special drops from Psychic. And given how many turns it actually takes to whittle down Mew's health, the odds are actually against you, so... Ugh. And Mew is not a dark type, so that means it is vulnerable to the Wob but it does have very strong mixed attacks, so wobbing is a bit risky. Psychic does actually have weaknesses in this game. It's weak to Ghost, it's weak to Dark, and it's weak to Bug. There are no good Shadow Ballers that you can use, so Ghost is out. There are no good Dark-type moves that can actually beat Mew before it kills you, so that is also out. Perhaps surprisingly, we turn to the humble Bug, but it will cost you at least two team slots. So you can set up Light Screen with Electabuzz, who will then die to Earthquake, RIP. 
but that means you can bring in Heracross, who in Prime Cup does actually have Mega Horn and will survive the Psychic thanks to the Light Screen. So as long as you hit the 85% chance for the Mega Horn, that's Mew gone. Is it worth the efforts? I don't know. I'm the strongest trainer in the world! Former Champion Blue has been demoted to just the Viridian City Gym Leader. He's got five incredibly powerful Pokemon and a Pidgeot. Most trainers in this game have an ace Pokemon that they will always bring. Blue is a little bit smarter. He doesn't always bring Arcanine, but he usually does. His most dangerous Pokemon is probably Alakazam. It's incredibly strong, but you can strongly discourage him from picking it. The AI counterpicks you. <laughs> it analyzes both your actual team, the entire one, as well as the lead Pokemon that you send out. So you can see we've got some of Johto's finest up in the corner. Importantly, we have Umbreon as both the first Pokemon we actually picked out of our six. And then if you send Umbreon out first, he won't send out Alakazam. And that way you don't have to deal with it. Live science. You can see that just having Umbreon on our roster meant that even though we led with the mighty Spinarak, he was so scared that he didn't send out Alakazam. That means that victory is ours. We're figuring out these strategies like, oh, this is pointless. He knows not to even try. Look at this. Wow. New speed running meta discovered live. Ah, oh, yeah. All right. I like our chances here gonna surrender. Maybe Blue's afraid of spiders. Other than counter counter picking him to make sure he doesn't bring Alakazam, I don't really have that much advice. His Pokemon are all really strong and his team is well balanced, so you just have to bring your own mix of strong Pokemon. Not Ladybus Centret Spinarak Shuckle or Slugma. Use what you learned in trainer school to try and come out on top. The best advice I can give you is to bring something that is good against Arcanine because he almost certainly brings Arcanine. And other than that, just try and wob him. I'm in this game. I'm the final boss of the gym leader castle and I, I gotta admit I'm a bit disappointing. Despite Red being the hero of Gen 1, he uses mostly Gen 2 Pokemon. I'd say that overall, Blue's team is much stronger than Red's. Most of Red's Pokemon are actually quite bad. The Scizor sucks. Jolteon cannot even touch ground types. And the Gen 2 starters being kinda crap actually does help you in this case, because even on the enemy side, they're still kinda crap. You scared of Meganium? I'm not. At his very core, Red is a Gen 1-er though, because he never got the memo that Tauros got nerfed. He almost always brings Tauros, and he tries to relive the glory days with Scope Lens Hyper Beam. I've got some good news for you though, very bad news for me. It's that Tauros is super easy to wob. All of Tauros' attacks are physical, so you can just press counter and win. Almost guaranteed. Well, I guess there's a 16% chance that he crits you. Are we sure this is red and not Ash? Because Ash has a whole herd of Tauros, so... Fell one of his Tauros and another takes its place. I'm imagining his round two team is much stronger, but hey, we're never gonna face that. After about an hour of intensive experimentation by the YTC lab, I've discovered an incredibly consistent strategy to defeat me. You'd think I would've known that strategy from the beginning. Let's say you don't want to actually use a real team. You could do this. So lead with Weezing and have Wob and Magneton in the back. He will lead with either Jolteon or Typhlosion. They cannot kill Weezing in one hit. Weezing uses self-destruct to take out their lead. He will then send out Tauros. Tauros only has physical attacks, so you can Wob him with counter guaranteed. And you should have enough HP left to Destiny Bond his last Pokemon, which will almost always be Feraligator, which is why we have Three fire types? The three fire types encourage him to bring Feraligator. And then even if something goes awry and Wobbuffet does not have enough HP left to actually get the Destiny Bond off against Feraligator, that's why I have Magneton, because Magneton then beats Feraligator, who does not have Earthquake. Does this strategy work 100% of the time? Nope, but it works a high percentage of the time and you only have to win once, so that's my suggestion. You're comparing yourself to me? Huh. 
Replacing the Mewtwo final boss of Pokemon Stadium 1 is a battle against your rival, an actual criminal. Which I guess must be how he got three incredibly powerful legendaries? It's never explained. So I know our team looks like an absolute mess, but it is actually very planned out. You can win almost 100% with this setup. What you do is lead with Voltorb. If you lead with Mewtwo, you've already won because you can Mirror Coat back Mewtwo's Psychic. Then he will send out Ho-Oh. Ho-Oh can be 1v1'd by Aerodactyl, showing him the power of the Ancients. And then once he's down to only one Pokemon left, Lapras Parish Song is a guaranteed win. There's nothing he can do. But what if he doesn't lead with Mewtwo? If he leads with Ho-Oh, you can just go to Aerodactyl, Ancient Power Rim, and then you'll win. If he leads with Lugia, you can then go to Hitmontop. He will set up Safeguard, and then he will Aero Blast you, and you can survive it and counter back to deal with Lugia. Corsola is there as a contingency plan if Voltorb dies, because Corsola can also Mirror Coat back Mewtwo's attacks. Wobbuffet is there for Wobbuffet things. Wobbuffet never changes. Always bring Wobbuffet. I heard a fan theory that the actual Pokemon Wobbuffet is the tail with the eyes, and that the whole blue part is just a puppet being controlled. Do you think we've been picking Wobbuffet? Or has Wobbuffet been picking us? It's a mystery. Ah! And that is the culmination of all the research we at the YTC Institute have to offer you. We're cheering for you in the chat log. You can do it. Good luck on round one. For round two, give up. Huge thanks to all the mighty Patreons who made this video possible. Be sure to join the Discord link in the description and consider evolving into a mighty Patreon yourself. Thank you.